Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, Ditch the Pump, FAA Regs and Tips for Electronic Attitude Indicator Installation. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of, this, of you joining us for the first time, uh, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices and you get access to over 10,000 aviation events, destinations, airport, restaurants. You even get a weekly email with a list of all the aviation events happening in your local area. Our mission is to give pilots like yourselves more reasons to get out there and fly. Now, in addition to events that you can fly to, we also have online events, which is why we are all here today. One of Social Flight's partners is Bendix King whose KI-300 electronic attitude indicator makes it easier than ever before to replace your old vacuum-powered attitude indicator, including the ability to add the KA-310, which feeds Bendix King Autopilot. So that's great news for pilots and aircraft owners, uh, but there are some things to understand when doing these conversions, and we hope to help with that information today. Before we get started, here's a few tips. Um, first of all, there will be a recording of today's presentation. We will make that available uh, through socialflight.com and on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just search on Social Flight, one word, on YouTube. That should be available in about 24 hours, and you'll also get a link to that after today's presentation via email. Now, during the presentation, feel free to post questions. There's a questions feature here in the webinar tool. Feel free to use that uh, to post. We'll do our best. First, we try to incorporate your questions into the presentation itself, and second, we'll try to uh, take some time at the end and, and uh, answer whatever questions we can. Now, if your question is very specific about your aircraft uh, or your situation, then uh, you may get an email instead afterwards directly from Bendix King helping you with your specific situation. So uh, no worries if you don't have your question answered. It will get answered through follow-up afterwards. Uh, and that should get you uh, going with that. So without for further ado, let's get started with today's presentation on Ditch the Pump, FAA regs and tips for electronic attitude installation. Um, quick thing, we'll, uh, we'll each kind of, I'd like to first, uh, just a quick introduction of myself, uh, uh, my background, I'm an AMP and IA mechanic. I've been in the avionics industry for a couple decades now, uh, a pilot, an aircraft owner. Above all else, I absolutely love aircraft like most of you. Um, I happen, if you read AOPA, I'm the maintenance columnist for AOPA Online. And uh, I also have a lot of experience in terms of I've been worked with the FAA before with uh, creating STCs and PMAs, uh, modification for Beechcraft, and uh, the uh, Flex Alert multifunction enunciator for gear and other alerts with the aircraft. And as I said before, come to you from Social Flight. And a little tidbit um, may get a kick out of the fact that uh, my boys and I are actually in the process of, of building a, a T-51 three-quarter scale Mustang and we decided to do that in our living and dining room since uh, it would put it would put it right in front of us. So uh, there's ways to get videos of that as well online. But all in all, love aircraft. That's why I'm here. And with that, I would like to introduce Stephen Pierce from Bendix King. Stephen, how are you doing? Uh, doing very well. Uh, and thank you for that, Jeff. Um, yeah, so pleasure to be uh, joining Jeff today on today's webinar. So my background is a UND graduate uh, with a major in aviation technology management. Um, through UND, I did get my commercial multi-engine uh, instrument writing there. Um, really passionate about aviation in general and been working with Bendix King uh, since 2016. Uh, many of you interact with me um, on a one-to-one -one basis through the forms, uh, whether that's Beach Talk, Pilots of America, uh, Mooney Space, Piper, um, anything online, basically, you're going to be seeing me. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can definitely post them on the forms. You can reach out to me directly uh, through private message um, through any of those as well. And uh, my email is included at the back end of this presentation. So if you do have anything, like Jeff said, that is a specific situation to yourself uh, and you'd like Bennix King to be addressing that, we can definitely make sure that that happens. So um, 
to kind of set this up, it's important to kind of know where uh, attitude systems came from and what they were originally intended to do and things along those lines. So to start with, the gyroscope um, was actually uh, invented by the Sperry Gyroscope Company uh, in 1944. And that was the first attitude indicator um, that was really made popular through aviation. So one of the big pushes obviously was wartime and being able to fly at night um, or through adverse weather conditions and still have a, a general idea of where your airplane was in relation to the ground. And so by having an attitude indicator that allowed um, the United States forces and other forces to deploy at night. And so that was a huge advantage aviation wise. Um, and it actually separated aviation um, from the rail industry because early aviation um, wouldn't take off um, at night or in adverse weather conditions. Um, so people actually often opted to go via train because trains went for pretty much any condition. And so with the advent of the gyroscope and the attitude indicator, it actually allowed aviation to start pushing past the rail companies. And that was the simple vacuum system um, developed by Sperry. And it's still very popular uh, in GA today, and we are gonna tell you why it's starting to get less popular. Um, but it was popular based on simplicity. And electric stuff first started um, getting implemented when it came to military applications. So military started to find that vacuum pumps, uh, the first generation of them, started to have problems when you went to altitude or you were going really fast uh, and the vacuum pump couldn't keep the gyros erect. Uh, it just couldn't make that gyro spin fast enough uh, when the airplanes were moving. Um, as we know, altitude decreases in dent, or air decreases in density as you go up in altitude. So that vacuum pump just doesn't function quite as well as it does when you're at sea level. And so the way that the military started dealing with was using an electric motor essentially to spool up that gyroscope. Um, and that was how they got around that. And then we fast forward to what we're gonna talk about today, which is the solid state. And that is what is used in most attitude indicators today that you are going to see um, RKI 300, many of the other panel mounted ones that you see on the market today. And those use a solid state gyro, which was really made possible through um, the micronization of electronics. So microelectronics is really what drove that push to this solid state attitude indicator that we see today, which is incredibly reliable compared to anything that has moving parts because we don't have anything to break. Or with a vacuum system, we don't need to worry about anything along those lines. And I think it's important to know that your your attitude indicator, I mean, that's coming on you know, 60 years now. And well, that's a long, long time. Uh, and that technology has not really changed if you are still using a vacuum attitude indicator. And with by going with something that's an electronic attitude indicator, we're actually starting to now step forward into the 21st century, which is where we should be. Uh, these are starting to get a lot cheaper and a lot more reliable. But the only thing that's really changed that drives the attitude indicator is your vacuum pump. So you've seen some increases in vacuum pump technology. You have wet vacuum pumps, dry vacuum pumps. And so that technology has slightly increased, decreased in weight. But what you actually see, what displays on your indicator really hasn't changed a whole lot. Yeah, for, you know, for those of you uh, that, that may have owned an aircraft uh, back uh, uh, during the 80s and 90s, uh, if you're like me, um, you pretty regularly got one of these service letters in the mail, which uh, was you could you could almost hear all of the aircraft owners' eyes roll when this would happen along the way. And this is important because it basically says this is this is the limit of the technology. And so we we would get this service letter that that came out that essentially says here that, um, hey, this is great that we provide you with this system and this technology in order to provide uh, uh, an attitude source for use in instrument conditions. Um, however, um, 
it's really important that you not use this as your main attitude source without a backup um, uh, based on that. And it literally had said in the letter, you know, that you must have a backup if you're going to be flying with this. And it's because the reliability of those systems just is just known by design to have challenges to it. And it's interesting because that, for a long time, the uh, FAA was uh, fairly resistant on, on loosening the regulations that made it possible to uh, make advancements beyond this because this was the type of technology they were used to dealing with. And, um, and change is, is difficult. We'll talk about those regs in a minute. But, you know, the, the challenges, uh, mandatory replacement times, if you're going to be uh, able to, to fly using vacuum pumps, the reliability, there have been advances. Um, I really do like some of the new pumps that at least have designs that make them um, a little more resilient to failure and contamination. But at the end of the day, not only does a failed vacuum pump destroy itself, and leave you without a primary attitude source in the aircraft. But actually, during the failure, the carbon veins inside the pump will uh, usually explode, and the dust will work its way back in the system and can contaminate the gyros as well. So uh, it is quite possible that you can actually damage the entire system um, as part of a vacuum, a, a vacuum failure. There's a lot of reasons to do that. And so ultimately, that's why we used to get these service letters that say, hey, this is great, but you need a backup. Um, so moving on from that, the next thing that's really important to understand uh, is what exactly is an attitude indicator versus a primary flight display? Because these concepts are very much starting to get gray between them. Um, and, and, and it's something that if we look at you know, a primary PFD, primary flight display, that is your main display of all of your required flight instruments, which have to do with your, your attitude, your airspeed, your altitude, um, and vertical speed. Uh, the, you know, these are your turn and bank. These are your primary instruments, your six pack essentially in electronic format. And the way that systems evolved is that this this was how the early systems were designed, where they were meant, they were primary displays, entire aircraft uh, dis, uh, control displays with backups that went along with it. Well, those had very, very high standards for what could be, the, uh, what was involved in engineering them. And because of that, the price tags that went along with them were also very, very high. And an attitude indicator alone is designed as just that just taking care of the attitude portion of that. And the interpretations have changed over time with the FAA to make this possible. And there's been a lot of graying of, of, of this. If we look back uh, in 2011, uh, AC 231311-1C came out. And this talked about how this was actually kind of guiding people in the other direction that said, that at this time, we're only, remember, we're only going back 10 years, only go back 10 years or so, a little bit, nine years, uh, to 2011, and you get this regulation that essentially is, is saying that it's not acceptable at this point to put any, if you're going to have an attitude indicator, you cannot put primary instruments anywhere on the panel and say that they are just situational awareness, that they're not certified as primary, therefore, we're going to put them in there. Um, and you can do it. So it's early, as recent as 2011, there was advisories that are essentially telling people you can't be taking either experimental or other things and putting it in there, saying it's supplemental to your primary instruments. Big, big change then comes around when we look at how this has actually evolved. First of all, let's talk about what actually happened during that, during that time since then. You go back to the time when that advisory circular came out and you had instruments like uh, EFIS 4050 that are here, systems that were available electronic on the market in uh, higher than $60,000 in some cases, and that's for two reasons. That's the technology that was required and the certification that's required. And uh, when I was involved in the avionics industry back at that point, I'll tell you, those electronic instruments were they were amazing works of art to military grade. I mean, it, the things that the FAA was requiring and the quality that was put into those units, were, uh, given where the technology was at the time, 
was astounding. And that drove these price points that we saw of all any available things at the time. It steadily came down and down and down. Now all of a sudden we're talking five thousand instead of and change versus sixty one thousand and change uh in getting there. Any commentary on that, Steve? I know you were around the phone. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing, and uh, I think this just goes to show um, why you didn't see a whole lot of these electrically driven attitude indicators and in HSIs in general aviation until recently. Um, most of those were vacuum driven, and that was just due to the fact that the cost of these systems was just astronomical, and you know, now it's so easy and the FAA has made it quite easy to replace some of this stuff. But back when we were looking at that, and I mean, the $61,000, that's obviously scaled up through today, um, but that is actually the current price of an E-50 system. And it just goes to show that that technology was so robust and the certification was just absurd what the FAA was requiring and now we can produce a, a KI 300 with a KA 310 which is the autopilot adapter for that for fifty three hundred dollars and just the time that goes into that obviously it's certified um, to a different standard but that standard is still incredibly high and it, right. it really just boggles my mind the difference in price there yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's fantastic stuff for all of us. Uh, um, but but it is interesting to look at in terms of the the regulations themselves and how they evolve, because th those two things happened at the same time. On on one end, the technology just uh, just evolved so quickly that the reliability became just so obvious that this is safer. Like the, at the beginning, it was. Of course, this is safer. It's electronic. We have known vacuum pump failures and predicting times that are happening that can be measured in hundreds of hours instead of tens of thousands of hours and things like that. And still difficult regulations existed, et cetera, that, that, that really set an extremely high bar that you didn't just have to be better than the vacuum system. You had to be like at a, at a skyrocketing level of, of certification. But what really ha also happened at the time, it's almost like um, the way for any of you out there that have, have kids, it's like the difference between how you raise your first and how you raise your second and your third. Um, the, the first systems that had to come through here had, had, you know, were treated like the first child with the highest bars possible. By the time the, the second and third ones came around, and we're now on this third generation, basically, of technology um, that the experimental aircraft market led with, and, and so many others, that the FAs relaxed and put out quite a bit of guidance in ways and with language that you'd never imagine happening back 10 years ago, um, which is really something, and I have come across quite a few people involved in the engineering and certification of earlier systems, and I have to tell you, they sound exactly like my oldest child when they say the same thing about like, well, uh, look at the stuff I had to do. <laughs> Which doesn't necessarily exist today. And so let's put like real rubber to the road here. Um, when we talk about this, uh, the, the most, the guidance that everybody's following right now is a policy statement known as PSACE 2308 R1. This is what governs attitude, uh, attitude indicator installs, provides overreaching guidance about it. We're going to review it with you today because this is this is really everything in your shop has to abide by and what you have to abide by when you go and put an attitude indicator in. Um, but even this has quite a few uh, graying areas. And basically, we'll go through this guidance. It talks about battery backup requirements that go along with it, et cetera. And there's been another AC that's also come out, AC 9175, which also turn, talks about turn coordinator requirements and how you can combine that. And so what you'll see as we piece this together is the FAA has essentially started to put this case, that's, uh, this, this policy that says, well, 
let's start with the fact that we understand and accept the, the risks involved with, with the vacuum pump system and the mechanical gyro system, and we want to provide you with an easy way to replace that uh, with technology that we know uh, is more reliable. And then we start blurring the lines from there with, well, as long as you're doing that, here is what a legitimate replacement is for a turn coordinator. Here's how you involve other instruments, et cetera. And uh, that's where things have, have certainly evolved. So let's talk about this policy statement. Um, first of all, for Part 23 aircraft under 6,000 pounds, that's what we're focused on. And so let's, we're talking Class 3 aircraft. And the bottom line is replace a single primary electrical driven attitude indicator with a single primary attitude indicator that's electronic. Um, you need to have a battery backup. You have to allow for partial panel. And uh, this is the uh, K300 shown right here. Yep. And as we focus first that it has to be a single instrument, then we'll talk about why that has, tends to vary a little bit as we go. And then the, it needs to have a backup battery. Now, the, uh, the backup, putting a backup battery in aircraft, the backup battery has to be certified. So there's some interesting things. First of all, there are some aircraft out there, not many. There's just a few, you know, a few certified aircraft out there that happen to have already a secondary backup uh, battery as part of the aircraft design. Sometimes that's a starter battery or some others. Uh, Columbia comes to mind. I think there's some others. And in that case, they say you can use that extra battery if you test it before each takeoff. Um, but otherwise, you need to have a certified battery. I know that uh, R.C. Allen makes one. There may be some others out there. But if you're going to do this, Take a look at what, what certified battery backups are available that you can install in the aircraft. Next has to do with how it actually goes in there. So um, you, you, there are requirements that stay in place, and the FAA is very clear in the policy document that uh, none of these things change. You have a primary field of view for the pilot, which you can go online and find out how the FAA defines the primary field of view. They give you angles from the eye level of the pilot, both laterally and vertically, and you, so you can't uh, leave things uh, in place and, and move it to another location or something that's outside of that. Seems obvious, but they want to point that out. Um, but ultimately, you need to comply with these other regs that have to do with visibility, location, et cetera, and stay there. So that makes sense. Straight in front of you, normally the attitude indicator is dead center at the top of the six pack. You have to replace it in the same location. We talked about the battery backup. Um, and then it actually goes into the specifics of it right, uh, right here. Um, first of all, it talks about that uh, installation. But one thing that's important to understand is you need to understand if your particular aircraft, uh, if you're going to do anything that modifies the panel itself, are you modifying a primary structure of the aircraft? If you know most of these instruments, especially the KA300, will go into place of the existing uh, instrument. If that's if, if there already is the, the three-inch hole there, and you're just going right into it, no worries. Uh, but they want to be very, very careful that this doesn't start turning into um, get these things getting bigger and bigger, and then you're modifying the panel, which is a primary structure in some aircraft, and still kind of considering it to be. A minor alteration uh, on the way. Um, very, very important that we're not actually all modifying the structure of the aircraft. Uh, any comments on that, Steve? Um, yeah, and that is 100% the case, Jeff, uh, is just making sure that when you do look at this, uh, there are some great resources if you are not sure if your panel is part of the primary structure. Um, ABS, America Bonanza Society, for those folks who have bonanzas, um, that's a great resource. Or obviously just, you know, tapping into your uh, flight manuals that come along with your airplane uh, to make sure that that is the case. Whoever is doing this install should know um, if that is 
a primary structure, but if you are, um, whether or not you are looking to do this alteration yourself, if you have your IA, A&P license, um, just make sure. It's one of those things, it's easy enough to find out that information, just make sure that that is the case. Um, and, you know, frankly, if it's sliding into an existing hole, you don't really need to worry about that because you aren't doing any modifications to your panel uh, excessively in regards to in regards to that. Right. Um, so minor changes uh, uh, in terms of uh, what you're actually doing in connections to the aircraft are also important in determining whether or not it's a major or a minor. And if we actually, uh, it, you know, in this case you can't redesign a system. You know, one of the interesting things about the distinctions that the FAA makes between any modification of major versus minor have to do with, are you altering the design of the system? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're tapping into it one way or another, but are you actually changing its design? And that matters both elect electrically as well as pneumatically. And so, uh, putting a T in to your, um, uh, your static and your feed feed in order to do something like, like the uh, instruments that are available as part of the KI-300 is not modifying the overall design of the system. But if you were doing something more dramatic and relocating where things were going to be in general, that might have a major effect. And the same thing is when we talk about battery backups, it's the same concept uh, that you're providing something for this instrument. But the minute you started changing something or tapping a backup system that affects the bus, well, that better be covered by the legalities of the backup battery that you're putting in, because that is by no means a minor alteration. Um, you're looking at backups, uh, whether they be alternators or batteries, you'll find that those are all STCs, very carefully done because they absolutely affect the design of the overall system with switches that turn uh, buses that were designed by the manufacturer on or off, et cetera. And this is a case of that right here because it specifically is written into the regs that if you're going to put in a, an attitude indicator, it has to have its own circuit with its own dedicated circuit breaker. And the FA was very specific about saying that. Again, that's not a change to the design of your system at all. You're utilizing your existing design, but it is a requirement of how you're going to go put this in place. So at the end of the day, what this really means is, first of all, you got basic or enhanced attitude indicators. Now, let's talk about that for a minute because we kind of went over it fairly quickly. So I'm going to back up a couple slides there and, and talk about that, um, that policy statement again for a minute. Now, there have been some revisions about on the FAA's policy. The, the FAA came out with that 2011 uh, advisory circular they came out and were pretty strict about that idea of putting anything else into this attitude indicator um, that would conflict with other certified instruments. And the first version of this uh, policy statement uh, came out and said that it was okay to put advisory information such as turn and slip indicators. And they they made it quite clear that you can present primary uh, attitude information and do a direct replacement, but that they were very comfortable with the idea of you adding some information into it, um, even though these uh, are were not in some cases, um, uh, uh, you know, fully certified as primary instruments, et cetera, or uh, how you go ahead and, and put them in, and. Um, what was interesting is that they revised this, and they came out with this uh, this revision to this. And one of the things they did is they removed that line, the actual line in there that said that it was okay to go and um, and have that went away. It was actually um, in this first one where it says replaced with a single primary electronically di driven attitude indicator. Used to say that you could add the the additional um, turn and slip. Now, when we talk to people uh, based on this and researching for this, what's interesting is when they removed that, 
it wasn't, I don't think it was so much to, to limit it and say that you can't do that anymore as it was that they didn't want to start setting very specific guy, uh, acceptance of exactly what you could and what you couldn't. When you look at something like the KI-300 here, what's important to note is that the airspeed and altitude information, those are TSO'd. Those are TSO'd instruments. And so it's really interesting balance that's being struck here as you've got a minor installation under this policy statement of an attitude indicator and TSO'd instrumentation for altitude and airspeed and VSI that is all being integrated into it now and fully allowed by the FAA, fully blessed and much, much safer than the infra, than what it what what it comes from, um, and we're doing it in this kind of unique way because we're still coming at it under the policy statement for attitude indicators. But really, when you look at it, what we're seeing, and this is this is not just a Bendix King thing. This is an industry thing. Is this line between what a primary flight display is versus what an attitude indicator is is getting very gray. And it's, it's a very interesting thing from a policy position to look at and to watch happen in the industry. And I think it's good for all of us. I think it's good for every aircraft owner and pilot out there that whether it's through this particular means that the FAA is comfortable, through this type of guidance, or whether it uh, would have been through the other method of coming at it as a primary flight uh, display, which is, I think, harder for them to evolve, uh, it's good for us because it allows us to pull those vacuum pumps out to get rid of mechanical gyros and to, and to be safer in general. And the other thing that's kind of interesting, if, you, if you're someone who likes digging into any of this or likes understanding some of it, another thing that also kind of came out is we get a lot of different things from the FAA, right? We have regulations, the FARs, um, CFR. We have uh, advisory circulars, ACs. Uh, and then we have this thing that maybe some people are a little less familiar with, a policy statement. Something that's good to know and important for you to know is that policy statements trump advisory circulars. Advisory circulars are guidance materials for regulators and for people in the field who do this work, and for aircraft owners, of course. Um, but a policy statement is a, a, almost a more official way of the FAA saying, we are in the process of changing our policies. We have not officially changed the, the you know, FAR, the, the CFRs, and the actual regs, but this is our official policy now. And so as you see some things that could be a little conflicting, um, know that the policy statement is generally regarded as being above an advisory circular. So important thing to kind of know as you do that and an important point as to why an instrument like the KI-300 with all this information in front of you is allowed and is, is even though it's so compelling. Now, you still have to keep the backups. Uh, Simon will talk about that and I um, hand off to, to, to him with the KI-300. Um, it's amazing how much information you have here for the price and you only have to go back maybe less than five years before you see radical, radical differences. Anything to add to that, Stephen? Yeah, and so I actually just want to add to exactly what you said about that kind of the overarching guidance from that policy memo um, there, Jeff. Um, talking to our folks who do do some of our certification work at Bendix King, um, not only is the, the policy statement um, kind of trumping that advisory circular, it almost um, seeds as uh, in place of like almost an STC as it provides the basis for installation guidance as well. And so you will see if you, you know, bought a KI-300 or anything along those lines, um, the policy memo is actually called out in the installation manual to help provide additional guidance for an installer um, installing anything along those lines. So that just kind of goes to show once again how that regulation is 
evolving within the FAA, um, showing that these policy statements are now being called out, not necessarily in lieu of an STC, but as another way for the FAA to help companies like Bendix King accelerate product development so we can get that kind of stuff out to you um, without going through an incredibly rigorous certification process like previously yeah. for the EFIS 4050 systems. Yeah, well stated. And, and I also want to be really, really clear because I, I, I may have, you know, uh, this may be misinterpreted or I may have misspoke a little bit in what I was trying to say, but, the, you know, these are still certified instruments. And uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that this this guidance does not mean that you can go and get anything experimental and throw it in or anything you know it, it literally if if you were to take it as as using any attitude indicator at all well then you'd go on Amazon and and get something that you know is meant for a truck going off road and say well this is fine that's not obviously the case here what it has to do with has to do with the application of instruments and making them applicable to different aircraft as opposed to a supplemental type certificate that says that you have to take and not just have an instrument meet the design criteria to get FAA approval but then beyond that have go through all the installation certification for every aircraft type that it is going to apply to and how you would replace an existing vacuum system that's what's changed. You, you now can take a, a, an instrument that can be certified for a lot less money and exist with the with same kind of standards, et cetera, and not worry about the application of it. It'll allow the, the policy statement to handle the installation and application of this, which then allows you to replace your vacuum system. So people that are familiar with the concept of AML, approved model lists, um, STC, supplemental type certificates, and all, all the thing would take you step by step about how you remove a very specific uh, instrument, replace it with this specific instrument, and then change the wiring. It doesn't have to be specified aircraft by aircraft. The policy statement just says, now you can get any certified attitude indicator, and you follow these steps and replace it, which then leads to the next step that we'll get to about, then you can yank your vacuum system, et cetera. So let's jump forward again. Okay, so we've talked about that, the basic and enhanced instruments. Now, another thing that's interesting, the policy silent on driving autopilots. Now, why? Well, it's because uh, that is not at all covered. Uh, autopilots are uh, carefully certified systems, which absolutely matter specific to the aircraft. And uh, Stephen will get into that more when it comes to the KI-300 and KI-310. Uh, but essentially, the beauty of separating those two things, the attitude portion from what's driving the autopilot, allows the attitude side to be um, following this policy, but autopilot integration, that is totally uh, not included in what's kind of covered here. Doesn't mean the units can't drive it, just means that they're, they have to be kept essentially separate when you do that. Uh, so we talked about backup batteries, dedicated circuits, and planning your panel layout and what you're going to do here. Uh, last step of this, vacuum system removal. Once you are, nothing is running off of it, that's the key. At that point, for your AMP, it's a minor alteration logbook entry to remove um, your uh, vacuum system, all associated components. Very important. I can't stress this enough because I have seen it done poorly. Very important that it's done properly, that um, the proper uh, covers and gaskets are put on so you're not getting leaking when after a uh, for the pad after a vacuum pump is removed that the proper seals and covers are done to your firewall so that you're not having any chance of carbon monoxide or anything else kind of coming out into the cabin. Very important that when all those hoses are removed, that everything, every step of this has to be done carefully and make sure that everything that is being driven by the VAC is accounted for. Um, just again, keep this all in mind. 
and of course that you're keeping uh, your backup instruments because that's required for uh, certainly for the KF300 and for every other one of these units that I'm aware of, um, if they are presenting you with any information that you still have your original airspeed indicator, VSI, altitude, altimeter, etc., and you haven't gone and taken those things which are still considered your primary instruments and stuck them away on the right side of the panel or down by your knee, um, you really have to have a plan that makes sense. Uh, Stephen, you want to take this? Sure. Um, yeah, and if you've been uh, listening to Jeff and I's recent webinars, um, one thing that we have stressed um, recently uh, is making sure that you do have a long-term plan for your panel. And this is just a fact of um, thinking about what your plan is for your airplane. Are, is this a starter airplane for you? Are you going to fly this for two, three years and then um, your family is going to outgrow it, for example, is something that I see quite often and you need to get a bigger airplane. So think about those sort of things when it comes to making your panel planning. Um, is it more advantageous maybe to do a larger upgrade up front and use something like a KI-300 as an electronic backup um, rather than keeping some of your original steam gauges when you do do a PFD upgrade or anything along those lines that you are able to remove that vacuum system? And then obviously, considering that primary field of view and primary structural consideration. So we did already kind of talk about that, but this is something that it's just good to be aware of. Um, and it might be worth actually looking at um, to see if your panel is part of a primary structure of your airplane. Um, and just having that sort of um, idea, if you are looking to do any upgrades, something that you are looking to do yourself maybe, um, just having that idea and then obviously your field of view. It's really important based on the FAA regulations to make sure that you are able to do partial panel and things along those lines when you do install these electronic attitude indicators. And that is part of the policy memo and frankly any um, company, whether it's Bendix King or L3 or Sandia or Garmin, um, any of those folks that have the attitude indicator that's installed via the policy memo follow the same rules, and that's that yeah, primary and, field of view. And and this becomes, you know, it may seem pretty straightforward, right? If you're if you're again if you're dealing with a three inch hole and you're just putting the thing right in there and in the way that you see it, uh, most of the in, uh, installations done, that's that's one thing. But more and more uh, people are looking at, well, how can I flush mount this? And, and this is also to try to give you some information on where the FAA thinking is and where the regulations are now because more and more products are going to keep coming out faster and faster in this area because it's evolving so quickly, which is going to mean displays and different sizes and things like that. You have to think that you nothing that the, the FAA is being very, very strict here that you can't just start cutting big holes in primary structures just uh, just because the regs say that the technology is okay to use. And that's the reason for that focus. And then uh, the last big thing here is just your backup power. Um, if you are having a electronic attitude indicator as your primary attitude source, make sure that that does have an adequate backup power for whatever your mission is. So the the FAA regs call for um, that to be at least 30 minutes of power. Now, if you are somebody who flies on long country, cross countries in you know heavy IMC or anything like that, that 30 minutes may not be long enough for you. There are other units, KI-300 being one of them, that has like a two-hour nominal power supply. And for something like that, that's probably enough to get you out of a lot of you know sticky situations and make sure that you can land your plane effectively. Is 30 minutes okay for you? It could be based on your mission. Maybe you need something longer. That's something that, as a personal choice, you need to decide when you are buying an instrument. Um, and that, once again, goes back to that mission thing. 
And lastly here, the pro, uh, partial panel scenarios. Uh, you know, er, early on in my career, I spent a lot of time with human factors work and avionics. And um, the, the way that we as pilots process information to read airspeed and altitude in tape form um, is and vertical speed it is very different from the way that we process the same information coming from our traditional steam gauges and you're still going to have your uh, you know, you're still going to have your your airspeed indicator that as your backup you're still going to have the other instruments that are there but it's very important when looking at that to say okay what does my partial panel look like now what actually with this new design that I'm going to come out with when I'm going to put a KA300 in what happens if I have an electrical system failure? What happens if I have an instrument failure? What happens if I have a pedo or a static failure? How it looks and how you fly it is really important to practice. And I can't emphasize that enough because your mind gets used to, when, when you have multiple presentations in front of you, and my aircraft has this as well, where you have, you can get airspeed in either tape form or in your regular steam gauge round format you inevitably end up trusting and focusing and flying using one of them primarily more than another. Um, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to say I am, I'm guilty that even though I've got the electronics in there, just based on how long I've been flying and what I grew up with in it, um, I spend more time looking at the round dial when it comes to airspeed. That, that just happens to be what I gravitate to, towards. So what happens differently in different scenarios uh, when you have when you have this new panel in front of you and what's it going to look like and so instead of practicing flying with only one scenario of covering something up you may have to practice doing it a couple different ways and that's really very very important especially if you're a serious IFR pilot and fly in, in tough conditions don't have it be the first time that uh, you're going to test partial panel scenarios with this new panel design and see I think that's quite interesting that you gravitate towards the the round dials because um, being a younger pilot uh, and going through UND which has entirely glass cockpits I frankly never even looked at a round dial um, <laughs> until recently and so when I see airspeed and altitude tapes, um, I find those very natural to read because that's what I learned to fly on. And so... Yes, you are absolutely dating me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was just kind of an interesting point uh, when talking to that partial panel scenario because I would be the polar opposite of exactly what Jeff explained there. Exactly, exactly. We fly together and you're going to look over and say, what's that, the clock? <laughs> I at least have a little more aviation knowledge than that, Jeff. <laughs> I just didn't think you were used to flying with the old steam gauges like uh, like an old guy like me. <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong there. But um, back on topic here, um, coming into the KI-300 and KI-310 combo, this is what um, pretty much anybody who has a KI-256 in their airplane, this is the combination that you are going to be installing because chances are you have some sort of Benix King autopilot, whether or not it's a KAP system or a KFC system, um, you are going to need this in order for that KI-300 to drive your autopilot. And that is a, a very important piece. And so we've spent a lot of time um, today over the last 50 minutes talking about the KI-300 and what that does and the fact that we're installing that via policy memo and everything along those lines, which is great. And that means that that installation is going to go very quickly, most likely, because it is going to be a minor alteration. But as soon as we start trying to tie an autopilot to that, we immediately have to jump on an STC. And so the KA310, which is this lovely silver box that you see on the right-hand side of your screen here, um, is the autopilot adapter for that. And so effectively what this does is it's going to convert digital to analog. So that signal goes to your analog autopilot, and then that autopilot feeds back an analog signal. It's converted back to digital, and that's displayed on your KI300.
And so that's virtually what this box does. Now this box does have an STC AML attached to it. This can that AML is located on our website. So if you are concerned about your airplane not being on there, definitely go check that. If you do have questions in regards to the AML, shoot me an email and we'll make sure that we get that stuff squared away. But price wise, you're going to be looking at that 5330 that we had on a previous slide there. That is with the KA310. So that is your KI300, your KA310 and your installation kits for both of those for that price. If you are just looking to install a KI300, as a backup instrument, you're looking at that roughly $4,000 MSRP. Now, what the KA310 does is it brings in native support for your Benix King autopilots. Now, there are companies that are going to be able to support, you know, Benix King autopilots through some other adapter or things like that. With the KI300, KA310 combo, um, you do have that native support for the KAP100, 150, and 200, uh, KFC150, 200, and 225, and I do believe actually the 275, KFC275 is on there as well. Less uh, popular autopilot from Benix King, but it is still there. Um, and one thing that uh, Jeff and I actually didn't touch on with the KI300 that I get a lot of questions on when I'm at trade shows and things like that is, well, I don't actually want to see the airspeed, the altitude um, on that. I want a bigger picture of just my attitude. Can I take those off? The answer is yes. So you can declutter the screen um, and you can do that through the setup menu. Um, so just holding down the indent knob there um, while you're powering up the unit will get you into the setup and configuration menu. Um, if you do need to do anything, you cannot do it in flight, unfortunately, um, but depending on what you want to do, you can most definitely play around with those altitude and airspeed tapes. Um, maybe you only want airspeed. Maybe you only want altitude. Maybe you only want attitude on there. Um, that is entirely up to you when you are configuring that. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind uh, when you are looking at that. If you do want a bigger attitude picture solely, um, we are able to uh, do that. Now. Absolutely. Um, feel free to go check out benixking.com um, to look at that AML. And like I said, if you do have any questions, my email here is, I think, coming up on the next slide. So, so uh, Stephen, before, before we hop to the next slide, a quick question. So do you happen to know, we did get a question from someone about uh, Mooney's, like the M20M with the KFC 150, just off, I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head. Well, um, it just so happens, let me uh, double check that here. I actually have this pulled up right away. Um, so the M20M, as currently right now, um, we have the M20 J, K, and S um, look to be the ones that we have certified for the uh, KI300. We are actively adding more airframes to this. Um, so with the addition of uh, more Moonies, obviously, and things along those lines. But the M20M is not currently on our AML for the KI300, KI310 combo. Okay, and correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously the uh, the KA310 only is, is only for these autopilots, right? Uh, and, and also the KI300's autopilot output is not something currently certified for any other autopilots. Is that correct? Um, that's my understanding, yes. And so um, your KA310 is going to provide your standard attitude data and everything along those lines. But in order to get a flight director or anything like that, you are going to need to pair it with a KA310. Okay. Um, another uh, a question we, that came up had to do with... Um, uh, with kind of um, mixing and matching when you have, uh, when you know, people want to replace their DG also, if they're going to get rid of their vacuum system completely. Um, obviously, there's no, there's nothing wrong if you have another solution that, that someone can install of mixing things so that they can have a different um, non vacuum based um, uh, uh, directional gyro uh, or display under there. Does Bendix King have any uh, plans that they're talking about having to do with the the, uh, the the unit directly below it, DG replacement? 
Yeah, typically a, like a KI-525, I think, is the the unit that's typically below that. Um, it is most definitely on our radar. We know that there are a lot of people hungry for uh, a matching panel setup. Um, it is not something that we have currently that is going to be out. Um, so just it's definitely on our radar, but not something that we have at the moment. Got it. And, and there are other solutions, obviously, that are available. I think the most important thing that matters for people who happen to have like a KI-256 uh, uh, there that want an electronic replacement for it right. is that the best replacement for that KI-256 is, is right here at 5330 of, of getting that combination of KI-300 and KI-310. Yes, correct, and it, absolutely, and that's the, the one thing is providing that solid attitude source for your your legacy KFC or KAP autopilot for sure. Excellent. So um, we have tried to incorporate as many of the questions as we can that have come in during today's presentation. But as Stephen mentioned, his email is right here, stephen.pierce at bendixking.com. And all anyone who sent in an, an email question, if you did not get a direct answer, you certainly will get one via email directly from. And I would just like to thank everyone. Stephen, thank you so much for, for joining me today and joining us for this presentation. Yeah, and thanks for having me, Jeff. And thanks, everybody else, for joining um, us on this endeavor. Uh, it was a lot of good research for myself. And I know Jeff uh, learned some things. Uh, himself as well. So it was a good thing for both of us, and I appreciate everybody else for uh, coming along for the ride. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone taking the time. And, and again, um, you know, this is an evolving space. So uh, they, I can assure you that there will be more information to come. The way that the FAA is approaching the evolution of these devices is uh, evolving quickly, and it is really, really wonderful to see because it's improving safety for all of us. Uh, and it is making all these instruments such as the KI-300 and KA-310 possible. And so, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, be sure to check out socialflight.com. That is where, if you register, you'll get more information about more upcoming webinars such as this, as well as many places that you can fly to as we start to enter into the colder weather and the northern climates. Uh, we want to make sure people get out there, pry open that hangar door, and see some of that blue sky. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our expert, Stephen Pierce, Blue Skies.